At least there are some clouds going about their business in this opening shot. A much, much better one awaits you all at the end of the episode. Such brazen bribery may continue. I mentioned a small water leak a few weeks back. A little moisture had got into the storage cubby hole nearest the main portside hatch and damaged the lining board. Two potential causes. One, that rain when the hatch is open or road condensation slipped down this gap in the hatch seal, which was not my handiwork I hasten to add. Or worse, potentially water ingress where the top and bottom halves of Allen's fiberglass shell meet. It seemed a coincidence that the moisture ended up directly beneath where water tends to flow down the outside during heavy rain, channeled by the steps. This was the only originally damaged section of rubber fender strip, and the galve steel has ended up quite manky, despite the coat of epoxy ceiling paint I gave it. Mossy green build-up. So before solving the other potential cause, I decided to neaten this up. Carving away the damaged rubber first, and then a clean, and a seal top and bottom to stop water catching. Those bolts will pass through and into the fiberglass. This is the way I'm fairly sure that the whole shell is put together around Alan's belt, so to speak. I'm thinking I may go around the whole boat and seal each bolt with mastic, in case water slowly tries to worm its way through any old original sealant. It's not warm enough yet for external glassing, but soon I'll run a section of smooth fiberglass over the top, so water flows directly down and over, unencumbered. Inside, it was time to sort out this pretty bodged job. I also emptied the cubby hole, applied an antifungal treatment, and then scrubbed it all clean. Away goes the old sealant that only bonded to the gel coat, not to the hatch plastic, and so only provided a seal through the clamping pressure of the screws. I've replaced this with a liberal quantity of better quality sealant, and hopefully no more issues with damp. It's hard to seal at the rear where the hinges are, as they need to be able to rotate. A slight design flaw, methinks. That was mercifully swift, so I'm now going to smuggle in a whole load of extra reflex heater installation gubbins. It won't get its own proper next episode until I'm firing up the heater, just in time for summer. Firstly, I'm cleaning up the edges of the heater tank access hatch hole with a knife and then checking I can get a spanner inside and actually use it. Then a neat little hole for the standpipe to mount through. To catch some of you up, I'm opting for the diesel to be supplied from the top, not a hole in the bottom. I also need another hole for a basic stainless breather. It doesn't have an anti-cap size seal like the expensive one I install into Allen's main fuel tank, but it'll be fine as I have a solution for that. It will not need to expel air as the screw cap will be open during refilling and will only admit air in to replace lost diesel as the heater draws fuel. When switched off, this little silicon cap should limit any drama to a mutually acceptable theatrical level. The standpipe fitting was a do-it-yourself job as the ready-made ones are flimsy, all stainless, and the joints need sealing. It turns out that the red hylotite doesn't like diesel, so I've got myself the medium strength, diesel friendly blue one. I can do the exterior hose tail now, but we'll use the one on the inside of the tank as the method of securing it all into the plastic. The flexible standpipe length needs to be carefully measured and cut, so it'll use up most of the diesel, but not hoover up any grot from the bottom of the tank. And then the installation. The hole was intentionally measured with care so that it's tight enough to need to be screwed in, not pushed through. And then the great moment arrives for the controversial access hatch. The tightening, the tightening of the hose tail inside. All secure. Remaining is to use another length of hose to modify Henry the Hoover so I can suck up the worst of the detritus inside. You've seen how the tank is mounted, flush to the wall, and restrained by two tight rubber straps. I may need to add another soft pad behind, or another section of angle for it to rest on, but we'll see and I think we'll get away without anti-slosh balls or foam in this tank. The heater won't be run in rough seas. Our calm, cold weather did not last, so these inside jobs were a necessity last week. Weather really has... Oh. Yeah, this is quite rainy, quite windy. But during a lull in the gales, I was unleashed and instantly ready to complain about a steel flue pipe. Look at the state that this flue liner was delivered to me in. It was like whoever cut my section of stainless pipe did so with a blunt junior hacksaw, whilst inebriated and having a an heated argument with his co-worker about whether it's okay to be a Taylor Swift fan. I needed to cut to size and sort out the ends. Naturally, this means a brief outing for the angle grinder, with only minimal sparks, before it needed to be rushed back under cover before the next torrent of heavy rain. 
The little offcuts were a good opportunity to see how resistant to fatigue this thin stainless steel is. The answer, impressively so. I doubt it'll crack easily. I also rifled through my spares box and have these old stainless fittings from Alan's previous life. They'll do nicely for my next job, having been cleaned up and the sharp corners ground off. I've bent the flues into shape, the least I can get away with but enough to do their job, and I quickly mount the steel fittings in my normal way, a slightly undersized hole so the screw can bite, and a blob of sealant to keep the insulated void sealed. You may ask why not just run the flue through mid-air directly into the chimney? Well, I think it'll get bashed, and so a midway solid anchor seems wise, plus it encroaches less into the cabin this way. I have some assorted good news for you. First of all, the damper. The damper actually exists. So this is the one that I got from Canada. That's going to go here. But to protect this backing here, because that might get warm, we're going to go with the same uh, principle that we had down in the, uh, the heater bay itself. We're going to go for Viton rubber, which is uh, very, very heat resistant. That will go against the fiberglass. And then um, there will be stainless steel um, here, which I will bond over the top, and that will be a, a shield, a reflector. All right, I'll do that. A quick heat shield job, as that well-informed chap just told you. High temperature silicon for the Viton onto the steel. And then the same story to whack it onto the wall, but not before keying the shiny, waxy gel coat to get a better bond. This was all rather satisfying. I hope it stays up. Should do. I was slightly dreading the damper and flue install, so prevaricated by doing the rest of the diesel plumbing. Ahoy, we have a filter and water separator. Some may consider this overkill for a reflex heater supply, but I need a filter of some sort. It's not that expensive, and shares the same cartridge as the one for Alan's engine. I put an angled rubber wedge behind the mounting plate as I want this vertical and not flush with the angled wall. The filter's placement now calls for a straight hose tail, not a right angled one. So a quick swap, some blue sealant, and we're done. The diesel heater over here, my reflex, has now finally got its fuel supply and you can see that the entire apparatus is now complete up here on the side. And I'll take you through all the different uh, components, all the details, all the ways it goes from here, through here, round here, along there and into there to be burned. I'll take you through the rest of it. A quick reminder of the tank fittings and that hatch that needs a few little bolts to hold the rubber seal tightly down. First in line will be a basic on off valve in case I want to halt the fuel supply and then a priming bulb. On it went, using precious top quality smooth edged oak clips, but then. Well, I should have listened to the advice a little bit better of the person in the comments months ago who told me not to use cheap bulb primers. Um, this isn't that cheap, it's just not ultra premium. Um, but as I was trying to fit this, um, the, little, uh, the little red teat has now uh, come free of its clamp there which means I don't think that's going to hold any diesel in. Um, that's not what we need. These clamps were barely holding the plastic tails in place, so I now have a much better one with metal parts and added a stainless Munson ring to hold it onto the wall. There we have the whole setup. The filter is now plumbed in and I've used some generic conduit to protect and guide the hose as it heads down to the heater. I can't put off the damper and flue any longer. I've talked about this damper a few times and now you can see that the mount and the shield on the wall is complete. So this I went to Vancouver, Canada to go and collect from the manufacturers um, and it's uh, chamfered at the top um, and not at the bottom so it means that when I attach the flue itself I'm, I'm going to have to play around with the flue to try and get the shaping right and then I can use extremely high temperature sealant over there um, to make all the joins. So that's what I'll do now. Um, and then once this is up on the wall, um, the way it's gonna be mounted is, I want it to be removable. Um, it's gonna have a couple of silicon wraps once I've got this protective layer off. And then I'm going to use, uh, I'm not sure what you actually call this. This is basically a do-it-yourself Jubilee clip. Um, it's when you just get a whole length of the, of the tape and a few uh, little gearboxes and then you put the whole things together. I, pr I probably should know what they're called, but I don't. Um, and then, I will have it mounted up there. Once it's up, I'll then be able to fiddle around with the nuts and bolts here to get the damper at the right setting. But anyway, uh, I'm quite happy with this because this has been basically the bottleneck trying to get this job finished. This is a hell of a fiddly job and I need to get the balance right. It needs to be tight enough to be secure, but not wound so tight that it distorts the thin stainless steel of the lightweight damper. It's not a sealed unit, as the whole point is that it lets air in, 
but I don't want to press the joints and widen the gaps. I'm padding behind the damper with some basalt tape and getting a sense of how I want it to look, opting to point the door away from the stove so that it draws in cabin air that's not being heated. At least it stayed put once I got the lower strap on and tight-ish, leaving me to fit the other, and then cut the ends to the right length and cap the sharp bits with rubber caps. The problem I'm finding is that the strap is rigid and doesn't conform to the non-circular overall shape that well. I may replace this with fiberglass cord and a tensioner, or even change it out for a large Munson ring screwed straight through the steel shield on the wall. We'll see. Hose clamps don't work well on this sort of flue pipe. It doesn't evenly constrict the flue as you tighten. Instead, the screw housing simply burrows its way down and dents the steel. So that's no good, and instead I've cut notches and tapered in the ends so that they fit inside the damper or the chimney entrance. It slides reasonably well onto the heater outlet pipe, and then thank- Alan! It slides reasonably well onto the heater outlet pipe, and then thankfully sits inside the damper's bottom end. This will be a permanent join, unlike the removable seals I want to make where the flue meets the heater and the chimney collar. So, I'm using a super high temperature sealant. It's an absolute brute to work with, incredibly thin and spidery. It slumps too. It slumps. It also skins over in a few minutes, yet doesn't cure fully for a day or two. Anyhow, the compromises you endure for a sealant that can handle over a thousand degrees of temperature. Once that's done, I'll neaten up the joins, partly for appearances sake, with some special high temperature flue sealant tape that's aluminium faced, so it should match quite neatly. I'm not going to lag this flue as I want as much heat as possible to end up in the boat, not outside. Both heater and flue will need a guardrail though, so they aren't as easy to fall against by accident. The rain disappeared, but the winds did not, and that really helped this rather smart view from atop Allen. Do keep buying copies of my books, folks. It makes my publisher happy, which makes me happy. Signed ones are available directly from me. Cheers in advance. Bye.